Our next guest speaker is a bit of a vedette ici dans l'Église Unie du Canada. Um, she's the 42e moderatrice de l'Église Unie, a bird whisperer, uh, my best friend. Uh, that's not true, but it'd be really cool. And um, please welcome the Right Reverend Jordan Campbell. it's awesome to be here. I cannot see a thing. <laughs> Just these bright lights. But I will squint at you nonetheless. <laughs> it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much, organizing team, for inviting me. How lucky am I? <laughs> Before I, I begin, I, I know you've already done the territorial acknowledgement, but I wasn't here for it, so I'd like to just acknowledge the land on which we are gathering, that it's the traditional territory of the Mohawk people, and to acknowledge the people of this land and to give thanks for their hospitality and welcoming us to be here. Uh, je dois dire que uh, mon français n'est pas très bien. <laughs> Et maintenant, uh, une année, un an, une année, uh, Passé. Uh, <laughs> mon français, c'est un, un peu euh, assez. <laughs> Mais uh, pour le, le, le passé année, année passée, uh, je n'ai parlé pas. <laughs> je n'ai pas parlé en français de tout. Jamais, jamais. Rien. Squat. Alors, aujourd'hui, je ne peux pas parler euh, en français beaucoup, mais j'essaie je, de parler quelques fois. Ok. Ok. Ah, merci. You are very generous. We have amongst us a number of of international guests who are here with us, which is very important. As the United Church of Canada, we understand that actually any time we gather as church, it is important to remember and to recognize and have represented among us the wider church, because the United Church of Canada is not the church, it's a part of the church of Jesus. And so we have other representatives of other parts of the church with us here. And I, like you can probably see less than I can, but I'm gonna say their names anyway. And I invite you, if you're comfortable to do so, when you hear your name or something that sounds close to it, um, <laughs> when you hear them, to, to stand up. Um, or something like that. Um, <laughs> And, and we won't clap for all of them until the end. And then we'll clap uproariously for all of them because all of these people have come a great distance to be with us here today to help us be a truly uh, broad and diverse gathering of the faithful. So from the PROK, which is the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea, these folks came from Korea to be here. Sola Yang. Xian Wei, Shun Park, ah, excellent. From Emmanuel Baptist Church in El Salvador, Victor Hernandez, ah, David Guardado. From the United Church of Christ in the Philippines, Larney Robles. Okay. From the Colombian Methodist Church, Paula Marquez there. From the United Reformed Church in the United Kingdom, John Grundy. John, people are pointing and I'm not seeing. Oh, way up over there. Fantastic. And it, from the United Church of Christ in the UFA, USA. <laughs> Thank you. 
from? We've got Robert and Debbie Kirk over there. And Karen Georgia Thompson. Karen Georgia there, near the back. All right, now, folks, a glorious applause. traveling some for, from so far to be with us. We are honored by your presence and enriched by him. Now, if I understand correctly, the theme of this event, the overarching theme, is be the church. Soyez l'église. Oui? Soyons. Ah, merci. Soyons l'église. Okay. Qu'est-ce que Qu'est-ce que c'est l'église? Qu'est-ce que c'est soignant l'église? <laughs> what indeed? What does it mean to be the church? Well, I've been thinking a lot about that, as you can well imagine. <laughs> and I wanted to share with you a few experiences that I have had that I would name as Experiences of being the church. Experiences of folks being the church. One that I had quite recently was at a London Conference Youth Forum. Some of you maybe were there. One of the things I kept hearing over and over again when I was at London Conference Youth Forum, which is a gathering similar to this, perhaps not quite this big, but it's the same idea as London Conference, and I heard uh, time and time again young people say, this is my home. This is where I can be me, with my guard down, my pretenses put aside, where I don't have to pretend for anyone. I can bring me and I belong here. I heard that over and over again. I heard young people there sharing their faith, praying spontaneously. And I, I was, and I, you know, I went in there kind of tired. And I came out of there so excited and so pumped about the church and uh, about the life and what the Spirit is doing in us. That was a real being the church experience for me at London Conference Youth Forum. Another place that I have experienced being the church. Uh, gosh, it might be 2011 when I and my partner and our daughter and a big group of folks from Saskatoon went to Vancouver. Yeah, oh, Saskatoon, hello. Shout out, Saskatoon. Let's hear it. Amen. A whole bunch of us from Saskatoon went to Vancouver and we participated. Oh, okay, Vancouver. Amen. <laughs> we participated yeah, in a week-long Go Project in Vancouver. Let, give me, let's hear for Go Project. Who's that participated in Go? Awesome. So here's some of the stuff that we did at Go Project. We picked garlic. Uh, we visited seniors in a nursing home and played bingo with them. Uh, we distributed bread at a food bank. Uh, we put together uh, safe injection kits uh, at downtown, uh, the, the east side of Vancouver, downtown. Safe injection kits are you know, for, for intravenous drug, drug users so that they have a, a way of taking their drugs. If they're going to take them, take them without getting diseases. They're clean kits. Put a bunch of those together. And we helped paint the entryway to First United Church in, uh, in Vancouver's East Side, which is a, a major drop-in center for folks who are living in poverty and living on the street. And I just want to invite you to take a moment to reflect on what on earth made that church? How is picking garlic, 
playing bingo with seniors, putting together safe injection kits, and painting an entryway at an outreach church. I'm not going to answer that. I just want you to reflect on that. For me, it was church. It was church to be there with a group of of young people doing these things and coming together at the end of the day and reflecting on where did we experience God in that and, and why did we do that and how does that relate to our faith. To me, that was church. Another place I experienced church, I wore this bracelet. It says... Um, Jordan TM 2014. The TM stands for Team Mexico. Yeah, Team Mexico. <laughs> it's the same people who shouted out around Saskatoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the incredible privilege of being part of a group that went down to Mexico and uh, in Cuernavaca, Mexico, and uh, I had, had an amazing experience there, but I want to tell you one tiny little piece of that experience. I got to meet a fellow by the name of Brother Alfonso. Brother Alfonso used to be a Catholic priest, but he got punted out of the Catholic Church because he was an out gay man, and they said no. And so he said, okay. So then he decided, though he was still called to be a priest, he was still called to, to serve God's people, um, and so he decided that there were others who were getting punted out of various churches because they were gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgendered or intersex or any number of other um, letters in that alphabet soup. And, and so he said, well, they need a church. So he just sort of opened his doors to, to be a church for queer questioning folks and allies uh, who needed a spiritual home and, and weren't welcome in other churches. And so that, in, and I got to worship with this small group of people in Alfonso's, in his home. And it was like the home du jour, because um, Al Alfonso and his church, every time they, they rented a place where Alfonso would live and the church could meet and the community found out, the landlord found out who they were, the, the lease was revoked and he had to move on. So we were meeting in his yard and just breaking bread together and saying prayers together. And that was an experience of church. But the other thing I want to tell you about Brother Alfonso is back in the 80s and the early 90s, the way he was practicing church was this, in, this was the AIDS crisis. And the AIDS crisis, um, even after here in Canada, the medications were available and um, hospice care was available for folks who were suffering from HIV AIDS. In Mexico, those were not available yet. And very often what happened when people were discovered to have HIV or AIDS, not only were they kicked out of their churches, they were often kicked out of their homes. There was no medication, there was no hospice care, it was a death sentence. But now folks were literally dying in the streets because they had nowhere else to go. Nobody would take them. So Brother Alfonso Read, read the Bible, he read the Gospels, and he saw there a calling. If he was gonna be a follower of Jesus, it meant that he had to do what Jesus did, and what he understood Jesus would do in this situation when there were people dying in the streets, is to go out there and to welcome them into his home so that they could die with dignity. So he spent about 10 years midwifing people into death people who were very sick. And what happened is a community of people gathered around him to help provide the pastoral care, to help feed these folks. They literally were just in his home. He put up a curtain and on one side was where um, he slept and on the other side is where people were basically in hospice care in his home. I experienced that, that story and my experience with Alfonso and his church. I experienced that as profound. And I have one, I could, I have a lot of experiences of church. Part of what I get to do right now is kind of travel around experience church. So I'm just going to tell you one more. And Jean-Daniel, I think you are here. I saw you earlier. You were standing here. And Jean-Daniel said, I'm not going to be there when you're speaking tonight because it's Wednesday. And he says, <laughs> but he's back. This is great. The reason Jean-Daniel wasn't going to be here because it's Wednesday is because Jean-Daniel, I hope you don't mind me telling this story. You weren't going to be here, but now you are. <laughs> Um, 
Oh, et, et pardonnez-moi, euh, en français. Oh, Chaque mercredi dans, dans l'année, hein, euh, Jean-Daniel et quelques jeunes adultes, hein, oui, um, gather uh, <rires> pour euh, te, euh, étudier la Bible. Et? Là, la Bible. Ah, ah merci. Uh, I missed that. That's okay. Um, et, et, et une fois, uh, j'ai gathered with avec cette groupe. I can't do it in French. I'm sorry, my French is so appalling. <laughs> I actually, when I gathered with set group, uh, I actually <laughs> preached a franglais sermon. And I, I stumbled through, it was, I had a lot of help, audience participation, but that was, as I said, a year and a half ago, this is now. Um, <laughs> this group gathers every Wednesday for Bible study and to share a meal and to just be a faith community together. It's a group of young adults. Uh, it's actually an ecumenical group. It's Anglicans and United Church folks, um, some from McGill, but some from all over. And, and they just gather to, to, to be a community together. And I heard some of them have said to me, you know, I don't necessarily go to church on Sunday. That's not where I find my faith community. But you can't keep me from Wednesday Bible study. That's my church. Jean Daniel told me he wasn't going to be here because despite the fact that it is August, which is summer holidays for folks in university, the, the Bible study group really didn't want to stop meeting. So he, he was going to have to be there, this group. Now, I don't know if, if they're all here. No. He must have talked them out of it. But this is a group. That, so, so while many folks um, sort of see summer as the time to take a little break from church, this is a group who are saying even though church is, has, has broken until September, we want to keep meeting. That's how important this church is for them. That's a profound example. I shared those stories with you just to kind of get your thinking going because I know all of you have had some experience of church it may not be a great experience of church or it might be fabulous I don't know but I want you to take a moment and think about a time when you experienced what you would call real church may not have been in a church building. It may not have been on a Sunday morning. It, it may not have looked like anything that, that gets called church normally. Just like pulling garlic doesn't normally get called church and, and bringing homeless, dying people into your house doesn't usually get called church. Think of some experience you've had. It also might have been in a church building on a Sunday morning and have been a very profound experience of church. Just wanted to take a moment to, to think about an experience that for you was church. While you're doing that, I'm going to ask somebody with good legs to um, come up here and grab a microphone. Somebody who can run up and down stairs. Oh, Pat, you already got it, man. You the man. Now, there's a lot of you, which means there's a lot of stories, and we're not going to have time to hear them all. But I would really appreciate hearing some of those experiences. So, if you are willing to share... See? Very back corner. Um, if you <laughs> I love it. 
If you're willing to share uh, your experience of church, put your hand up. There's another one over here. And one there. Okay. So we're going to take like maybe half a dozen of these. So uh, we'll start up there. We'll go here and then over here. All right. You're on. So my name's Athena, and my being at church is when my church takes a trip to um, our sister church in Cali, Colombia, and with the children and um, the time we spent the time we spend together, I just feel like I'm at home, and that's where my church is, even though it's so far away, and we only go once every so years. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Shannon. Um, mine is when I'm at like conferences and stuff, just being with like all of my friends and stuff. The like feeling when you're all together. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Oh, we need a microphone down here. I think it's you. Hi. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, okay, up here and then here. Sorry, go ahead. Um, hi, my name's Kelly. Um, for me, church is the summer camp I've worked, I worked with for years. Um, every week, we would, the kids would stand out in front of the church and hand out cookies and lemonades and notes of hope to everyone who walked by. And just seeing some of the genuine smiles those kids handing these things out put on some of these bases. Um, just to me is really definitive of what church is. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evan, and I think I have, like for me, it's one big moment that was very profound to me, and that was um, at General Council, last General Council, Youth Forum. I know people there will actually remember this. Um, I, we always did a prayer at the end of our night gathering, and it was the last night, and I'd been struggling something, so that was the night I came out as bisexual. And I didn't have any other community that I could have done that at that time, so that was very profoundly church to me. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we'll take two more. There's one there. Uh, hello, my name is Paul. And uh, I would say probably it's kind of a weird church, uh, but the time that I feel closest to God is when I'm taking off or landing in an airplane. I, uh, I'm so afraid, and I always just take a moment and just say, uh, dear God, like, please can this be a safe flight? It doesn't need to be comfortable, just safe. And I kind of envision him like in a golden light, just like surrounding the plane, surrounding everyone, and like we're taking off. I feel safer, and nothing's going wrong so far, so I keep doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And last one, back over here. All right, what's up, guys? All right, uh, okay, so yeah, I'm Sam. And for me, church isn't necessarily like getting together with a bunch of people in the big building and a lot of jazz. It's more like sitting down and having a meaningful conversation with uh, my friends, for example, or family, and kind of just chatting and getting an experience to uh, connect with God via conversation and debate with a very uh, wide variety of opinions. That way, you get uh, to feel more of how God connects with other people and you can get, like, expand your horizon, I guess. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing those. And, and for everybody who was willing to share or was, did, did that exercise, um, I want to thank you. Some of the themes that I, I noticed and the stories that leapt out for me, and I heard some of them echoed in your stories, um, were a sense of community whether it's a big gathered community, or whether it's a small group of friends, uh, whether it's a community gathered to serve lemonade, or a safe space uh, in which you can just bring your deepest truths. Um, 
church is about community and it's it's interesting you know there's a lot of communities that we have in our lives we're all part of multiple multiple communities and hopefully <coughs> lots of those or at least many of those are safe places for us are are uh, comfortable places to be places we can be ourselves i hope that that is true for you um, what makes church different is it's it's that when it's at its best church is that safe place we can be truly who we are but it's it's rooted in christ it's rooted in jesus church is a, a community of folks who desire to learn about and to follow jesus Right? So there's other safe communities we can be a part of, and that is awesome. What makes church different from those, in addition to being a safe place to be ourselves, is that it's also a place that challenges us. Because being a follower of Jesus is about knowing that we're loved as we are for who we are. Being a follower of Jesus is knowing that we are absolutely 100% beloved of God and not a darn thing you can do to change that nothing you can do or say nothing that happens to you can ever change that you are relentlessly loved by god fact yeah. Thank you. we don't always know that but it is true and church when it's doing its job reminds us of that but it also calls us to something more it calls us not just to know that for ourselves but to act like it's true of everyone else in the world to act like it's true of creation itself that god relentlessly loves creation god relentlessly loves the person who gets on your nerves <laughs> and church is the place that we practice being followers of Jesus who lived that truth. So Jesus, when he began his ministry, here comes French again, folks, wait for it. He said, suivez-moi. Huh? Suivez-moi. It's actually how he began. Sorry, that was it. Um, <laughs> he, Jesus, we don't hear much about him except a little bit in Luke until he suddenly pops out on the scene in his early 30s and where his cousin is down at the river and baptizing people and Jesus says, yeah, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna go get baptized. He gets baptized, but he has this like, what? <laughs> experience when he comes up out of the water. And it's such an intense experience of God's spirit coming upon him that he goes and he spends 40 days wrestling in the wilderness with what does that mean? And he comes out of the wilderness saying, okay, I got it. I'm called to this ministry. I'm called to embody God's love in the world in some pretty key ways that don't look like feeding myself, that don't look like uh, utilizing this gift that has been given to me to kind of build myself up and, and increase my status, that doesn't look like manipulating power, but, but looks like something else. So you can read those wilderness experiences to get a handle on that. But he comes out going, okay, I'm called to be an alternative. The very first thing he does is start gathering people around him. Suivez-moi. Suivez-moi, he says to the fishers, the fishermen. Suivez-moi, he says to the tax collectors. Suivez-moi, he says to the poets sitting under the tree pondering life. Suivez-moi, whoever you are, follow me. Follow me. That was the beginning of the Jesus movement, which is what church is, is a community of Jesus followers. And what does it mean to follow Jesus? I mean, it means loving people. It means being nice. It means being kind sometimes. I mean, loving, yes, always. Kind, yes, always. Nice sometimes. <laughs> Because sometimes you have to be uh, kind of a poop disturber <laughs> if you're going to follow Jesus. Because Jesus disturbed poop. <laughs> That's what he did. 
right? When he saw injustice, he, he wasn't nice about that. He was loving. But he just said, um, you don't get to do that. That's not on. That structure over there that privileges some while creating injustice for others, that's not on. That exploiting people's need and vulnerability, it's not on. That seeking you know, your own comfort, your own um, security, regardless of the consequences for others, not on. If you want to follow me, and he invited any and everyone to follow him, rich and poor, uh, elites and social outcasts, he invited them all, but he said, here's the thing, you have to leave the garbage at the door. Because the, the structures of oppression, they're not welcome here. You are welcome here. But you are welcome to participate in an alternative way of being in the world. That is what he called us to follow an alternative set of values, an alternative way of being in the world. I was supposed to be a Q&A, so I better wrap this up soon. Um, so I'll just give you a little taste of that alternative. It involved opening the eyes of the blind. That means you and me who can be blind to our own privilege, to our, the way that our lifestyle impacts on others, how it impacts on the earth, who, who can be blind to the fact that because I find the police to be a friendly group of people doesn't mean that everybody has that same experience. I can be so blind to that. Being a follower of Jesus is being willing to have my eyes opened. He was forever going around opening the eyes of the blind. It means being a community of loving your enemies. Loving those who hate you but not tolerating un injustice. So loving even the perpetrators of injustice while insisting that the injustice end. That's a sort of alternative community. It's so much easier to decide who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and to align yourself with the good guys and, and to have, um, that was gonna be rude, uh, and, <laughs> and not liking and hating and disparaging and simply wanting nothing to do with and writing off the bad, the bad guys. Friends, we're all good guys. We're all bad guys. We are all beloved. Following Jesus means living that truth. Following Jesus means that our priorities shift. It's not just about uh, getting the new coolest thing. It's not just about figuring out how I can make the most money uh, and have the coolest toys. It's actually about how I can be the, a person of compassion in the world, how I can make a difference in the lives of others, how I can ensure that those who are underprivileged are honored and recognized and their rights and their lives and their dignity are honored and how those who are overprivileged are helped to get over it. <laughs> it's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's an alternative. It's a very radical thing. It's an extremely difficult thing to really follow this guy. And you see what happened to him, right? Like, let's never ignore that little. You, you know how that story goes, right? Like, it, it doesn't generally make you very popular when you challenge the status quo when you say, hey, the values of this society and the, the way that we're treating people is, um, is not okay. A lot of people are really invested in things the way they are, and so they get a little, they get their nose out of joint when we challenge that, which is why the very first thing he does is to create community. You can't do it on your own. None of us can. We need one another. We need communities of support and encouragement and accountability. We need folks who are going to say, I'm sorry, Jordan, you are being a horse's behind. <laughs> you are being very self-absorbed. You need to pull your head out of your bottom. <laughs> we need that. I need it, I need you. You need one another. We need each other. That's why Jesus forms us into community. 
It's why church is actually a, a collective noun. I haven't spoken very much in French, so I'm going to say this. Avez-vous des questions? (laughs) (laughs) Who's got the microphone, the roving microphones? Oh, good man. That's run at somebody. There's a question at the back. And here's the thing, it's so hard for me to see you. I'm not likely to see your hands in order. There's another one here. So if we have two roving mics, I saw one back there and one here. And it might be that you're gonna have to, I see one up there. You might have to shout out at some point. And we have like six minutes to worship. So we'll try to keep the questions and answers short. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Jordan, I'm Leanne. Um, When we talk about being the church and radically being the church, what advice do you have for the people who want to do it all at the same time? We want to be allies for everyone and speak the truth to all. How do we prioritize and how do you make those decisions? Exactly. I will, um, yes. So embedded in the question is the understanding, I think, you can't do it all. You can't do any, everything, nobody can. Better that you should find the thing that really calls to you, that is the thing, and it, it's probably gonna be the one you want to avoid. So when I started out sort of in my social just, early social justice days, it was around the anti-apartheid movement. And so I got very involved in the anti-apartheid movement and I went to South Africa on an exchange and when I was there and being appalled by apartheid and being appalled by those white South Africans and how could they live with this? And it was black South Africans who said to me, uh-huh, you need to go home and you need to look at your own reality because this apartheid system is based on, the structure of it is based on the indigenous reserve system in Canada. So that was the work that was handed to me. You want to be in solidarity with us in South Africa? Go be in solidarity with indigenous people in Canada. So you need to find the thing that you can really plunge yourself into. You honor the rest of them but you need to focus or you will burn out. Good, thank you. Next, who else is holding a microphone? Do you have a microphone? You just want a microphone. No, I have a microphone. Oh, there's one over here, thank you. Yeah. I am standing, no. (laughs) It's not that much different. Um, So I'm I'm now, uh, I grew up in the United Church, I'm now middle-aged and went to uh, uh, seminary and everything, and I'm really happy to hear you (laughs) talk so passionately about being the community of Jesus Christ, because there was a period where that uh, was not something, uh, it was kind of like, yeah, Jesus, but just right? That name, that identity, uh, and even that story. So um, I, I, f- I have a sense that we're, uh, because it might be uh, offensive or in and of itself a-, a form of exclusion. And so could you just say a bit more about why for yourself, um, you know, as, as uh, someone committed to following uh, Jesus and being the church, why is that? Why is that important to you? Why do you feel that it's important as, as Christians that we be comfortable and, and uh, uh, empowered by, that, uh, by the Christian story and, and, and Jesus Christ? Well, I'll start by saying it's the story that makes sense to me, probably because it's the story in which I was raised. Um, it is a very challenging story. It's also one that resonates with my experience. The whole um, death precedes resurrection, that's my experience. You want that fullness of life to which God is calling us? It means a serious, serious letting go, even death, to something that feels 
like me, like essential to who I am in order to embrace who God intends for me to be. So that story resonates for me. It is not the only way to know God. Um, there are other paths to knowing God and being faithful. This is the path that has a claim on me. Also because Jesus was somebody who was extremely concerned with how we practice love in the world and not hung up on what we believed. Jesus was not particularly doctrinal. He didn't say, you know, oh, you gotta believe that my mama, she never done it before she had me, you know? <laughs> and like, he, he wasn't concerned with believing all the right things. He was concerned with practicing the love of God every, in every way for everyone. For me, that resonates because I don't know. I, 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 often, I change what I believe from time to time, but this story has a, a claim on me regardless of what my particular thinking is today. And that's the other thing I want to, like, being church is more about how we are in the world than what we believe in our heads. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, yeah. Hi, um, so my question comes from being a youth and especially being a youth in the United Church where the idea about talking about your faith, especially to ooh, other youth, is absolutely terrifying and almost taboo. So what would be like your five that you'd write in a news article, top steps for talking about your faith to other people, not involved in the church, or maybe involved in the church? Not involved or maybe involved. Uh, well, I, um, so in the order that they occurred to me in my head, practice, like, like just do it. Um, Humility, right? Like nobody wants to be told how right you are and how they really need to hear what you know, right? That doesn't generally appeal to anyone. Um, but, but being humble. Uh, preach with your actions more than with your words, right? So you wanna share your faith with people? Let them read it all over you. And then they might even, I've had an experience where somebody said to me as I was handing him a sandwich, he said, why are you doing this? Why are you giving me this? And, and I thought it was a moment where I could just say, oh, because I'm a really nice person. And I could say, but I, what I did say is um, because my faith tells me this is what I need to do. And we left it there. But he asked. But it was because he first he read my faith in my actions. Um, I don't know, was that three or four? I'll add practice and practice. There's a five. <laughs> Hello, my name is Afaf Muhammad, and you know, Afaf Muhammad, where you come from as Islamic religions. I've been here long enough in Canada. My background is Anglican Church, and I work with it since when I was 16, to be a mother for two siblings. The South Sudan world affects all of us. You live in the center, you live in South Sudan, is the same thing. My question is, why we just dropped everything and love one another and accept what Jesus did to other? To just love. I don't come all the way across Pacific Ocean, people judge me by skin color. I didn't create it. And I'm really happy that person created to be black. I'm, I'm proud of that. But when I came, because as in Khartoum, you see the mosque every corner. The first time when I landed here, I see the church every corner. I was so excited. I say, I'm gonna do so much. But I visit most the churches in Winnipeg. Because I guess I want to find out which churches I can fit in and with my boys. I have three boys as a single mom. Don't give up. God got your back. 
do not. You say, oh, I'm single, I can't do it. You can do it, why not? I'm doing it now, three boys. No working, no job, but every time I ask God, provide for me. Last Christmas, just that's the story, I'm gonna end it. My son, he's now playing basketball. The shoes is expensive to buy for him. Christmas hamper people phone me and they ask him because he's 16 now, he's out of the list. And they ask me, they say, what's it? I'm not gonna count to just two sons you have, but I'm gonna count them as three. Look at God who can do for us. The shoes cost 500. Look at this. I'm really, but I wanna just fit in. Please, those generation, they're the youngest. We need to teach them to love one another. The where I came from, you eat one meal, and that's it. You have to provide for tomorrow again because you can have a three meal. But here, our kids, they have everything. But they, I don't see there is no love. We need to create that and to call God help us. And thank you. Thank you. Do we have one more? Over there. 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 Hi. Hi. I'm not, I'm not going to get up. <laughs> oh, my name is Tanaka. I'm from Calgary, Alberta. And <laughs> um, you know how we take those little moments for granted, even like the quiet little moment you have with your parents and you just think it's nothing? I just came back from Zimbabwe after nine years, and I noticed that while I was with my family, even those little quiet moments meant far more than like even the iPhones that we hold up to our faces every day. Just looking at the person you care about, it's, it's more than looking at like Instagram pictures or talking to your friends all day about basically nothing in general. I mean, I'm not gonna say I don't like my friends, but I care about you guys too, but it's those tiny little moments that we, we tend to just say, oh, it doesn't matter, my family's always gonna be there. The truth is, it's always gonna be there, but you're gonna grow up and then you're gonna end up forgetting about most of them or just like not caring about the things they're doing in their lives. So what I'm trying to say is, you guys, as kids our age, we need to start taking these little moments with our parents far more seriously than we do right now. Your cell phone did not raise you. Your cell phone. <laughs> is not working a nine to five job to make sure she's paying the bills or she's buying the groceries or she's doing anything for you. Your parents are basically what's making you think the way you're thinking now. They are the people who make your morals today. So I would just like for all of us to just just be more appreciative of the fact that we have parents. I saw kids out there who are living on the streets with no one. We have far more than we even know we do. So your mom, your dad, even your grandparents, when they come over and you guys are just looking at your phones, pay attention, because you never know how long it's gonna last. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions, your stories, your wisdom. Uh, we've got a whole weekend together the next few days to practice being, creating the experience of church here together so that we can carry that experience with us. 
out into our whole lives. So thank you for beginning it in such a good way.